particulate matter, CO, uh, nitrous dioxide, uh, ozone, Carbon. So, Carbon. SO2. Carbon. So, the, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the, those are the criteria pollutants. Mm -hmm. They have they have national ambient air quality standards. The hundred list of 187 is from you know the Clean Air Act. Uh, that's they're called hazardous air pollutants, mm -hmm. and they're a list that Congress uh, created and EPA maintains. They add and remove as they feel you know appropriate. Our state those are regulated at the federal level by the programs that I was talking about called maximum achievable control technology. State, the state of Virginia, also regulates that same list as toxic pollutants. It's just a different name, it's jargon. Um, that, they're subject to the state toxics rule, and we have exemption thresholds for those compounds, and if a facility doesn't emit those compounds or emits less than those thresholds, then they're not subject to that program. This facility emitted formaldehyde and hexane, the two that I've been talking about tonight, those were the two from that list that they emit over their respective exemption thresholds. And that's why we, re we required oxidation catalyst for the formaldehyde for control from the turbines. And then we did all the startup and shutdown, venting reductions, the system testing, you know, making them not able to really vent any of that, a very, very, very small quantity. And, and also the daily walk arounds for the, the equipment that's just leaking. I was talking about that, where they have to go and fix those leaks, um, and then also the quarterly camera, and I think that's what Jude was talking about, where you know they, they use a camera to, to detect those types of leaks. Also. So they do that. So quarterly. you are looking at all 187. We we calculate the amount of emissions that are expected from natural gas combustion. Natural gas combustion is a pretty standard. If I remember right, there were 12 or 13. Um, I'd have to look at the exact application to, to get the right number. But only two of those, most of them are, are you know, so far below the exemption level, it's, it's not really something to look at. But hexane and formaldehyde were above it, and so we regulated those quite heavily. Um, let me just make sure. Shot, Swan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's your uh, air pollutant studies based on s each single pollutant? And or does it also study the combination of those pollutants which become more toxic as they are combined in the air? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. The second question, is there a difference between air model analysis that you did and what's called air dispersion model, which studies the weather pattern uh, and wind pattern and seasonal patterns as well? Yes, uh, second question first, they're the same thing. So the program looks at meteorolog meteorological data, um, and, and so wind patterns, yeah, the terrain, the type of land use, you know, whether it's trees or whether it's pavement, all those things impact the air and how pollutants get dispersed within the air. So that's the second question. The first question is each of the standards are set, but like for the criteria pollutants, they're set by EPA, they're on a pollutant by pollutant basis. They look at those pollutants and they determine the appropriate averaging times. So they do not do studies for the com combination that happens of those pollutants in the air. So you're saying they do not? No, they look at the science for the pollutant. Each pollutant. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that that's generally right. We have it. We don't. <laughs> We regulate to the standards that are there. I understand that there are studies that look at the pollutants in combination. One thing to keep in mind, as Pat mentioned in response to an earlier question, there are 180-something toxic pollutants. With respect to this compressor station, there are only two that are emitted in any real, you know, in, in any number of concerns. It just, you know, the rest of the pollutants just aren't relevant to the combustion process or the pipeline gas here. So we looked at two, uh, those two pollutants, formaldehyde and hexane. The rest were emitted in such de minimis quantities you couldn't even model them and you couldn't do a comparative analysis like that anyways for the, for the other pollutants. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what constitutes a violation and what are the consequences of the violation? Okay, we, we kind of talked about that. Um, the violation is when you have a requirement that you don't meet. A, a requirement that you don't meet. Okay. So it could be any number of things. It could be an emission rate that's too high. It could be that 
you had too many shutdowns, um, you, know, you didn't keep records, that's a violation. So if you just didn't keep records, that's a violation. If you Over didn't do monitoring. Time, Excuse me, I'm sorry. Is there a time period where a violation uh, for example with the um, emission standards are too high? Would it be a week, a month, or what? Um, it depends on the standard. So like, like I was talking about earlier, each pollutant has a different, you know, the NACs have different averaging periods, and so our standards have different averaging periods as well. Uh, like record keeping, monitoring. If we require continuous monitoring, that's once every 15 minutes you have to monitor. So that's one standard. We have a pound, pound of emissions per hour. That's a different standard. We have the parts per million, the concentration-based numbers are a three-hour standard, you know, which you normally do a stack test, a performance test for. It's usually three hours. So it would be an average over that. If you're over that for any three-hour period, that's a violation. If you don't keep your monitoring data for every 15 minutes, that's a violation. So it, it really just depends. But And then we talked about the, the penalties, you know, Obviously, we focus on getting people back into compliance, but I think the regulation is like $32,000 is the maximum. But if you, you know, didn't send a notification and you missed it by one day, I'm not sure that's equivalent to exceeding your emission rate, you know, for even one hour. They're just not equivalent. There's a matrix, and we have a whole process that we lay out on how we calculate those based on all those parameters. And here again, we assess violations on a case-by-case -case basis and so we can find them. Do you have the capacity to shut it down? Yes. If they don't comply? Yes. You do. Oh, you okay. do. Having said that, we don't resort no. to that too frequently, but we do have that authority if we think human health and environment is being threatened. Okay. Thank you. Over here. So when you say, I'm sorry, I thought you were no, no, I was, I was just letting them know that I, I heard them and I'll come, I'll come over here next. I apologize. So when you say that you focus on getting them into compliance, does that mean um, you don't issue um, a fine or you you you, you no, 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 go on for weeks and weeks and let it no. go? Because that seems to be what's been occurring yeah. in other areas of the pipeline. And so I, I'm concerned about the DEQ's monitoring because I haven't seen it. Being effective, personally. No, um, I, sorry, I was I was trying to get away from focusing on how much a violation would be. That's all I was trying to get at. That it's more important to have the impact on the air quality decrease back into where they were permitted or where they would be compliant. That's significantly more important than collecting money. Well, so my specific question is, if they are out of compliance, and I guess you could only find that out if you happen to do a surprise inspection no no we have actually we require them to report to us every six months um, there, there are a host of things um, that would allow us to understand that. and if they're out is that an automatic fine do they are like they I said it depends on the situation if uh, you know and, and some of this is not, I'm not an inspector but you know if if it's it's a different response and it should be a different response if, if they submit a notification one day late um, then they had an emission violation where they emitted more than they were allowed to. The, you know, and that's about as detailed as everything else is case by case, which means that we look at the situation and make our decision based on that. the facts at hand. Uh, I said I'd come over here. I got you. Yes, ma'am. Does DEQ... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I thought it was... Okay, okay, <laughs> you guys are together. Does DEQ have plan to establish fence line monitoring system uh, to notify local residents when air pollution level from uh, the compressor station are unsafe? We, you know, have a permit that requires them to emit below certain levels and then prove that they're emitting below there. And then the modeling, the air dispersion modeling, shows that at the fence line they're well below the standard. And then as you go out from that fence line, right, just the fence around the property, as you go out, the, the pollution drops off drastically. Um, but, I just say, but, to get that but, but the short answer to your question is no. The permit does not propose that. We're certainly willing to entertain comments to that effect. Thank you. Okay. 
Stephanie? Oh. Uh, Ruby. Oh, oh I, I thought they were. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they each have I apologize. I did say they were next. It's a problem with doing it this way. That's okay. You can help her. Okay. I'm just really surprised with all the monitoring that needs to be done that there's no inclusion in the permit about on site staffing. Well, it's not really integral to proving compliance. Um, obviously, like I said earlier to the other question, they have to do a daily walk around. That's in the permit, it's required in the permit. And so I don't know how else they could do it besides having at least somebody on site daily. Um, it doesn't permit so the use of a drone. I mean, right. for instance, if, if they wanted to, I, I don't think we drones would Drones can't smell. Yeah, <laughs> we're not with that as, as a compliance no, method. So. No, 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 what's the so, I mean, it's part of the test. I mean, obviously. Is that written into the, into the drone? It's not a drone? No, it's not. But the Which way it's phrased, well, I don't, how, how's it phrased? Yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if we would consider it, I'm, I'm not sure of our regulatory authority for that. But, I mean, again, that goes to the whole thing. But those types of comments are things we hadn't thought about. That's why we have a public comment period. Um, it's at least related to air quality, so. Because I think what some of us understood was that there would be somebody on the site the first year, and then it would be monitored long distance from this point. Well, that's the operation of the, of the compressor station. You know, that we don't monitor or regulate. We're looking at the air quality. Right, and, but that's And when we, you know, it, they have to meet the standards in our permit. And as Pat said, I think, you know, the daily walk around would require a daily presence on site. Now, whether that person is actually in residence, works nine to five at the facility or not, you know, that would not be required under the permit. Generally, we would not require on site staffing per se, but they have to be staffed adequately to meet all the requirements in the permit. And that daily walk around doesn't go away after a year. Right. You know, if, if we issue this draft permit and it contains the daily walk around that's currently in there, that will be in there. So it, it's not like that, you know, in a year it's going to change. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, that's just where my, where my question started was I was surprised with all of the, the information they have to give you that having long distance oversight on that would be adequate for yeah, there, I mean, some computers, some things can be done through computers, and that's why I keep focusing on the ADA, the, the walk around. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have to type out my question because um, I want to make sure I get everything in. According to a project description on the DEQ website, the estimated effect on air quality near the facility from the proposed project is that all emissions will comply with all applicable ambient air quality standards. What is the difference between the ambient air quality now in the air around the proposed project and what is allowable? Um, so if, you know, we could pull up numbers, the actual, on the website, the modeling report has a table that has three columns. And one of those columns is the background concentration. And one of those columns is the impact from the facility. So you can actually identify the increase in concentration from the facility. Just want to make sure I, I reiterate this. It occurs at the fence line. And it is the worst case emissions from all the scenarios that we looked at. It's not what is going to be going on on a daily basis, we're looking at worst case. And so, but that, there's a table in the modeling report online that has that information in it. Um, it's, you know, it's a relatively small facility. There are compressor stations that emit thousands of tons of NOx. And this facility emits 34 tons of NOx. So, I mean, it's just, I know everybody is concerned with the number and, and I, I just want to keep stressing that it, it's somewhat relative in terms of, you know, when, we're, when you're thinking about how, how large a site is and comparing it to other compressor stations. There are some really, really high emitting compressor stations out there. So to me, any kind of poisonous gases that are released into the air are going to be harmful. 
you know, it's not going to be just for one year or two years or three years. It's going to be for many years. Mm -hmm. And we have to breathe this. That's going to be harmful to us. The ambient air quality standards consider that. They consider chronic exposure. So but chronic is okay, long-term. Long I mean, they're an annual standard, mm -hmm. right? So every year you have to meet that. But when EPA is setting it, they don't, they don't just look at one single year. Okay. But, but what I'm getting at, that's okay for us to breathe it. Because you, you, you don't live in this area. I live in this area. That's right. And to me, that is just not fair. That's what I'm talking about, air quality. It's well, not fair. All, all I can tell you is that there are health-based standards that have been established by EPA and by our state on the toxics, uh, in our toxics program. And emissions from this facility will not violate those ambient air quality standards. I, I don't know really what more to say. One can argue with those standards, but we're not here to do that this evening. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Uh, um, could the ACP increase the amount of gas compressed at the uh, Buckingham Compressor Station in the future without additional air permitting? Do you mean install additional equipment? No. I mean, the, the equipment that is generally used, the compressor turbines, would emit at a quantity that would require them to get a permit. They would also have to, even if there were some change that they made that didn't require a permit, it may require, require a change to the current permit, and so we would have to go through the review process again. That's, that's kind of how the, the system is set up. So they can operate under the current scenario without changing the permit. Um, because it's protective of you know human health until and if they want to make a change and operate in some other manner then they would have to you know, make sure that they got the appropriate permits. Okay, I have another question. Oh yes ma'am. Yeah. Um, is the comment period and hearing legitimate since we saw that DEQ drafted an approval letter to ACP with the conditions and emission limits predetermined? in it um, that was written before the comment period even started? No, uh, that's part of the standard process yeah, is to, oh, uh, did, we, did we already approve the permit and is this comment period moot? Uh, no, we, we haven't approved the, the permit. We're here tonight presenting our proposed or our draft permit that we're accepting public comment on. It's a standard practice to send the permit to the source to let them know what's coming their way. Um, if they would like to change something or submit additional information because they disagree with us, uh, you know that's that's part of the process. Just like the application back and forth is, but we're not allowed to approve the permit before the end of a comment period. And for this permit, we are not even approving it. The Air Pollution Control Board is the one who's going to vote on that in late October, early November is the estimate. Yes, ma'am. The contaminants that are collected, say in the picking process, mm -hmm. what, where, where are they? They're taken off site and disposed of. There, you know. Where, 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 where would they be disposed oh. of? Oh, uh, landfill. I'm not really sure how they're regulated. That's more of a solid it's reason. Not your problem. Well, <laughs> not that it's not my problem. It's that I'm limited in what I can do. Yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, there are like 700 regulations that I have to know, and and I that's just in air. So it's really hard for me to know 700 regulations in air and then know all of the other other, other regulations. So you know, you kind of have to focus on your program. We're bound by regulatory authorities, and so. I, you know, I might but want to know stuff, but yeah. But, 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 but it is DEQ's issue. But you, we're not the experts on that. That's all we're saying. It is DEQ's issue. We're the air group. Justin Williams is the director of our land and uh, of our land and revitalization, the waste and land revitalization division. He would, he or his staff would be the ones to best direct that question to. But that's not part of this permit process, but it is part of DEQ's overall role divide and conquer. Well, you know, it's a very, the, the environmental world is extremely complex. And I wish I knew everything, but I don't. And neither does anyone at DEQ and neither does anyone in this audience. We have a lot of experts. We're staffed with a lot of experts. And we're all expert in different things. So if you'll be patient with us and talk to our various people, we will tell you who to contact. I can't give you the answer to that, and neither can Pat. 
who will try to get you the answer to it, or our folks can. I mean, that's you know, that, that's all I can promise you guys. I wish I knew everything we don't. Yeah, and then I'll come back to you. There's there are going to be other uh, sources of hexane, like uh, hydrocarbon storage tanks. Or this is probably the larger, largest source on the site, but it's not going to operate very much unless you know there's power loss and um, they do some testing for it. But yes, we did consider all the emissions at the site. Um, yep. You said right. that every six months they give you lots of data and so forth. What can we do so that we could verify what they're doing and know that we're getting accurate and full information that it's not being cherry picked to make us think we're safe when we're not? Mm -hmm. But what can what information is public? Well, there's information that we receive is public, and you can you know FOIA Freedom of Information Act. Um, you can do that when we have that information. Uh, we have the ability to go on site, but the public doesn't have that legal authority to just go on site whenever they want. Well, I didn't want to go on site. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to stay as far from it as I can. Yeah, I, I can't think. Sometimes there are some limited exceptions for confidential business information. There has never, been. That never applies to emissions data. Okay. Emissions information is always publicly available. Um, their reports, their their yeah, their sure all reports. Yeah, I, I can't imagine yeah. that anything would be. Uh, you know, and, and I would recommend too. There have been a lot of questions here about compliance and enforcement. We keep our consent orders. <coughs> if you look on the DEQ website, um, you can get an idea of what our consent orders are like by looking on the DEQ website as to how we approach compliance. Uh, on various things. So we do it according you know, here again, here again the divide and conquer thing, I don't wish to pass the buck, but enforcement is generally done in another division. Um, but we work closely with the enforcement division. Um, Jerome used to be air compliance manager. I have another, I, unfortunately my air compliance manager, Todd Alonzo, couldn't make it here tonight, but he is, a, he is one that you could direct questions to about our compliance program in general. I'm sure he'd be glad to talk to you about how, you know, hopefully give you some assurance that, yeah, the, you know, the compressor station is on our radar scope. It will be on our radar scope if it gets constructed. And comments about monitoring and things are appropriate to the air quality permit if they're related to? Yeah, and, and, and I'll just add, especially on compliance, our permits have to be enforceable. You know, and sometimes, you know, comments on, gee, how are you going to enforce this provision in the permit? Those are very legitimate. We, we look for those comments. Because sometimes how you enforce permit permit terms are sometimes difficult to enforce on the ground, as you'll see. So we're always open to comments on how we could make permits more enforceable. You know, if we miss something, you know, that's those are comments we you know very much welcome. But you had your hand up when uh, Lady in Red was asking. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, it's inherent in the process we go through. The other quick part is, is uh, when I hear leaks, I think explosions. Now these are uh, really, that's why you need a camera on occasion, is because a lot of these leaks are just wisps. Like if you, if you Google, you're going to see, you know, guys trying to sell cameras that show huge clouds. They probably happen. But a lot of the leaks that you're going to find when you're doing a rigorous, using that word again, sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> You, when, they, when you do the daily walk around and, and you're always looking at your equipment, you're doing the quarterly camera, um, the leaks that you're going to find aren't going to be the enormous ones. They're going to be little wisps, and that's why you use the camera so you can see them, tighten them down, stop the leak before it gets out of hand. It's too, too bad that oh. video didn't work. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's just kind of neat, but... Um, it, it was kind of what Pat's talking about. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. When this all started over four years ago, Dominion initially came in as a compressor something different they have to come back to us. Well, I'm saying that if you do uh, allow us to fill, I hope you don't, that you put that in this condition, no further expansion, period. And, and as, a, as a term of it. The other thing is, we, uh, on the water, I 
know that's not your thing, but ever since they started cutting the trees, there have been numerous violations of the federal control, and they haven't performed well. Lots of mistakes, lots of things they neglected. Dominion will agree to anything, but comply with nothing. And if you trust them, I think that's terribly naive. Thank you. Yep. Uh, on the on the first thing, I do want to say I don't want to leave that one hanging. I'm not sure of our regulatory authority, but your first comments, you know, question would be a comment that you could submit so that we can consider that as part of the, you know, the formal record. <coughs> you know, I don't want you to lose that. That is related to what we're doing. Um, hold on. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, thank you. <laughs> you said um, earlier, and I'm not sure I remember correctly, mm -hmm. but I think you said that there could be ten. Shutdowns per year? Yes. Okay, and if there are, I think, four turbines in this facility, yes. Yes. is it 10 shutdowns for each turbine? Yes. So that means 40? Yes. There, and, and, and actually, to be to be clear, because I know this has been, there, it's, you know, there's kind of the same words being used to describe two different things. Okay. They're actually allowed to shut down the turbines a hundred times a year. Each turbine can shut down 100 times a year. Okay. They can only open up the piping and vent that turbine 10 times a year. So it's not, it's two separate requirements. Okay, but essentially they can vent 40 times a year. Yes. Which is essentially four times a month, about generally. Um, three something, three something. Yeah, close enough. Okay. Now, the, I mean, you know, it's it's the amount each turbine has a different volume that'll be emitted, and we modeled those those emissions. We we did air dispersion modeling to compare those to the health standards. So it's not like there, it's just a blank check. You know, we did we we allowed that, but we also considered that when we did our quality. It's just a but 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 the the emissions are not averages. The emissions peak. Yes, and that's how we model them. So these these turbine these turbine blowdown events occur within one hour. So we treat them as if they occur within one hour. We don't average them out. So there's a disconnect in you know how I probably how I've been talking about it, where there are a lot of things applicability of various programs that are based on tons per year of annual emissions, but our review drills way down to the hour. So it's not like we just average an annual emission rate and say, oh, that's the most you can do in any one hour. No, we look and we say, okay, you can do 40 of these a year, that's this many tons per year, but you can also do four of these in an hour. So we gotta look at that and we gotta compare that to the ambient air quality standards to make sure that we're protecting the population. But, but the peaks are, um, are not within that ambient air quality average, correct? Yes, we, we consider those, that's what I'm saying. We, we model them and- I and think we're not talking the same way. The peak has to be, to get the average, there have to be highs and lows. So the peak is above the we, average. We model, well, yes, okay. but, but we model the peak. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to, I'm trying to answer what I think is an air quality question, but maybe you're getting at something else. So I, I, we model the peak, but yes, in any data set, the highest number in a data set is uh, either the same or larger than the average. Okay, well, but you're saying that the peak is, is below the when, ambient air quality averages. Okay, yeah. no, the standard, okay. the ambient air quality standard, I apologize. Okay. Is it, sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So could you in your draft, because I've, I've been involved in this for about four years. I live in Nelson. And I'm very concerned for the community here. And there's been, to me, I see this aversion for cumulative impact. She brought it up a little earlier. And I'm concerned because as a nurse also, I realize that the thought of things, the fear of things, is just as real as if it isn't even happening. So the anxiety of the worry about the water, the quality of the air, the risk of explosion. It's on this community. 
And so what I said is that in your draft, you recognize that. You say yes, but this is our niche, so we're sticking in here. And I think somebody in the specialty area needs to say in their draft proposal, we propose, we draft, that Dominion takes, you know, does a study, gets hires somebody independently to look at these cumulative impacts because yes, we are concerned with these people's health and the cumulative impacts are important and they do play differently out that way. So why can't you in your draft could propose looking at the cumulative impact of all the things that this community is having to fail with. Well, well, we've already put out the draft, so it can't go into the draft, but if you make a comment to that effect, we'll certainly consider it. If well, this is my point, then what's the point of us being here? The point of you being here is to bring things like that to our, yeah, to our attention that you can comment change. on that we may. No, 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 we, no. We, we can't. The permit yeah. right now is draft. It's yeah. not in its final yeah. form. Oh, it's not so it's that you won't give yeah. us yeah. Oh, right. or what we will consider. Yeah. It's not the now, but it could be. Well, well, this is the draft permit. And this is the comment period. This is precisely what I'm having the comment period, so we can take comments like well, that. Well, I highly recommend that somebody in one of these specialties, it's like a doctor looking at a specialty and not considering the anesthesiologist that's putting the person. Yeah, oh, good. No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, that, that's a very legitimate comment to make. This is an informal process, so what you're commenting tonight doesn't put it on the record, so I well, strongly I recommend you, okay. you know, you need to come to the hearing or file a written comment. But it is that something effect. that would be... We uh, would certainly yeah. consider it. Okay. Yeah, we understand your concern on that, and we understand your comment, but you'll make it, you know, we, the, 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 the permit, the draft permit is not written in stone. That's the whole point of this, and, and it's not even going to be DEQ that determines the final permit. It's going to be the board. They can either vote it as we propose it, they can change the conditions, or they can deny it based on the law. So, so please comment. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. How does DEQ check ACP's modeling to see if it jives with reality? We we review it. Um, we we go through, and by reality, modeling is a computer program. EPA has a multitude of protocols that you have to follow. They approve programs, and there, there's a very, you know step-by-step -step process with a lot of rules that have to be followed and just like we review the application and ask questions and say well we think this is backed or we want to know more about this or you have to tell us something about this the modeling review is the same way um, it's not that we just accept it and go thanks and check it's it's reviewed to make sure that they did it correctly that all of the data files and the computer programs match up and follow EPA protocols. And I'll, I'll add to that, the, the models that we use are all EPA approved. <coughs> and for EPA to approve those models, they truth them. In other words, they see if the models do add up to what's actually happening. So before a model is approved by EPA that this is a good model, that is something they look at to see if the model actually does show what's really happening. So that has gone, that process has gone on with EPA before they can approve a model, then we use those approved models. It's very difficult to get a new model approved. Is the computer generated model based on the actual topography? Yes, ma'am. There's, there's meteorological data, there's land use data, there's topography. Uh, it's, it's really complex. There's actually a multitude of computer programs that go into, you know, the final analysis. Check. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry, I thought you raised your hand. No, okay. um, so, uh, the question of, of the stress that, 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 that it, this is causing. Um, four years of not knowing what this is going to mean to our lives has created a lot of sense of uh, helplessness we don't, we, because we don't know that the question that, you know, what's going to happen to us. You're giving us a lot of assurances, but they're based on standards that a lot of us here don't really believe are adequate to really protect us. And every time we hear a blowdown, our stress levels are going to go sky high. We don't know what we're getting. We really don't, despite the standards. Despite that, despite the fact that you guys are trying to do the best you can with what you can give. So I really want to emphasize the stress quality of this. Stress
causes disease. It causes disease. But I want to also address another question, and it's, it's the public process. Um, you've been interacting with Dominion for months now. We just got this application, what, a couple of weeks ago? So we really, we really feel as though we should have adequate dialogue and time to look at this. This is a complicated application. Most of us here don't have a good understanding. I certainly don't. A lot of, 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 a lot of the questions were raised tonight and, at, and earlier in a smaller meeting. But there's so many more questions. And there's, we need time to really look at this and try to understand it. And for those of us who do understand it, to try to talk to our community members. And we've not been given adequate time to do that. We really haven't. So, yes. You can, you can make that comment, I mean, it's part of the process, but it's not really specific, it's more of a position. So I'll move on. Um, go ahead, Matt. Well, it's, it's not really, it's not something we can answer right now, so I want to try and get as many people's questions, like you said, they probably have questions, so we want to try and answer them. Go ahead, ma'am. So, just want to make sure I've got this right. So, all of the compliance monitoring is done by the industry that's profiting from the pipeline and the compressor speed. All of the data or monitoring for compliance comes from the person who may or may not be in the company, that may or may not be in Except for the surprise visits, which right. might have been quite mm -hmm. Okay, yes. And the consequences of not being in compliance are not defined in the air permit or really anywhere. No, there is a regulation. That is yeah, a day, day, maybe it's a year day, I don't know. How sick are you? It's, there, there's no, no, I didn't there's mean to no give you that consequences that are defined for being out of compliance as part of the air permit, right? Well, well we, it's I just don't, can I say something real quick? Right. I didn't mean to give you the impression that that's what we were saying. I think Mike's going to answer Absolutely the question, no, but I appear, clearly I did, so I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I mean, no. It, generally, don't put in all the compliance regulatory requirements of the permits. You have to refer back to no, the what the penalties are. For being out of compliance is yeah. what I'm asking. Right. They are not defined anywhere in any of the permits. They're in the law. Virginia law. In the law. Yes. Yes. yes we, or the authority to do this and that. Yes. Design, but they're not the time. You do this and this will happen. Right. That's not anywhere. Well, and it's also not a citizen prerogative. That's DEQ's prerogative and the state prerogative. That's one of the reasons it's not in the permit. What I mean is that the you know DEQ enforces the permits. So that's. But it's your prerogative, but it's not in the permit. Well, it, no, no, they, how can I say, the, the citizens can't enforce permits, certainly not directly. But so, we do, and we know what those regulations are. So, yeah, you know. Okay, my third question is, the, the, there is no current way for the current place to go and get this quantitative risk assessment. It's not you because you're air, it's not water because they're not air, it's not the governor, it's not, there's no place. It's generally not done in Virginia with the air permit. That's right, it's generally for not. For what's really going to happen to these impacted communities. There's well, no place to take that or ask for I mean, I guess we would disagree insofar as we think the air permit deals very strongly with what the air impacts will be. They're okay. below the health base standards and has the best available control technology installed on any compressor station in the country. We think the permit adequately deals with the human health aspects of this. Of the air? Yes. Of the compressor? Yes. Is there... Let's, does anybody else have any... I, I was going to say, I think... I know... I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, Yeah, we got to keep going. Okay. Um, just to... Yeah, I have one. Uh, we all know historically these, these compressor stations are sited communities of color. Uh, the question would be, would these standards that you have be any different if this was a community of white people? No, no. It'd be a free economic situation. Now, you can smile and laugh at that, but it's true. Please take a look at our permits. Yeah. There was... 
to have a dialogue with you. Um, I think that this is the beginning of that. I would hope that the comment period could be extended. I know you've got your rules, but it doesn't seem like it's been a level playing field. It really doesn't. Um, but in the short amount of time that we have had, um, we have generated 107 questions and really have done it in the last week, maybe, from various members of the community. And in speaking about the community, we'd like to submit that to you. If you could answer as many of these questions as possible, we'd like them all answered. Some of them were answered tonight, but I'd like to submit that to you. Um, and also, just, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but not everyone knows this, the last few days we have actually got 98 signatures asking for uh, for a quality uh, risk assessment. And, and we just want this to go on record. We feel we deserve this, despite the standards and the, mo you know, the modeling, and, you know, and you're meeting the regulations and you're going above and beyond. We're not really completely satisfied that that's really indeed going to protect our health. We're still feeling extremely vulnerable. Um, we'd also like to see that agencies work with other agencies to see that we get health risk assessments. When you turn in, can you put your yeah. name and address or email address on there? Sure. That way, that way we, yeah. we have somebody to contact. Um, and I will continue to get signatures. Yeah, We've got very little time. This is just in a very needed area. I didn't even get to Ellis House, and she is the closest to the professor. Um, all right, so I just want to re-emphasize uh, a couple things. Public comment period, comments about air quality, air quality related to the facility and our permit. Anything you see, if you found a new permit that you don't think are considered or regulation, you know, those are the types of comments that are most impactful. I do want to let everybody know Comments are treated equally, whether they're at the hearing or not. There are probably going to be a lot of people at the hearing. We have a limited amount of time. So if you're planning on coming to the hearing and actually speaking, I suggest that you bring your comments in written form. That's a good idea anyways, and then summarize them orally. But you can hand in your actual official comment because you don't want to be the 407th person and uh, we only got 406 in. So I strongly suggest that you bring your complete written comments, and if you get up and get to speak, summarize those comments during the, the session. That'll also give us enough time to have as many people come through as possible. So I just, I've had people be surprised that, you know, that would be a, a good idea. And so I just wanted to stress that to everybody tonight. Go ahead, Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming.